Hey, I'm Phil. Thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you're here and we would love to get connected with you and your family. So one easy way that you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount that you want to give to 84321 or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's message. Well, good morning again. A little more in here now that we start. We start with announcements, and you guys were out enjoying each other, right? And getting a feel for everything. So it is good to be back here again with you. And my name is Randy Johnson, often just references Doc, and so it's easy. Just so what's up, Doc? is an easy way to remember that, and so the kids may not like it, but the adults do, right? So we just, we remember those days. But um, I was um, thinking about Duggars 20 and Counting. Anybody ever watch that show? I'm one who actually, you're, you're familiar with the show, right? They have 20 and Counting. You have 20 kids, and why stop there, right? And continue on with it. And when you, when you think of the 20 and Counting, do you think of more blessing or more pain? And the answer is probably yes. <laughs> Does that make sense? The, the, the larger families, there's a lot more blessing with it, but there's also a lot more challenges or a lot more we go through together. I did a Google search on something I thought was fun. It's back to the 1700s, and there was um, a lady named Valentina. So we're getting close to Valentine's Day. So Valentina uh, Valiz- Valiziva and her husband, Theodore, the number of children they had. And I know you're thinking through a number right now. It's more than that. Let's just give you an idea. 16 pairs of twins. (laughs) Seven sets of triplets. Cheaper by the dozen or something. Four sets of quadruplets. So, um, yeah, I, 69 children. Now, Theodore, allegedly, he didn't have any listed. Uh, th- yeah, Theodore um, had a second wife. And 18 more children. For 87 children, I think is what the number came down for. Um, and there were more twins and triplets. No quadruplets for that one. So, I know. I, and, I, and I read through that and I said, doesn't your family feel better already? <laughs> I'm just thinking of, for the health of women everywhere, Right? Um, Albert Einstein, I did not expect this quote from him, but I greatly appreciate it. He says, Rejoice with your family in the beautiful land in, of life. And I'm like, Albert Einstein, I, I didn't know if he even thought about daily things. <laughs> you know, I thought his mind was always out here, but just rejoice with your family in the beautiful land of life. Every February, the River Church likes to take a family month. And just focus on family. And then I realize when I'm talking about family, um, there have been some recent deaths. And recent can be months and years, right? It can go extended. That when you think of family, there are the positive things, but there's also some pain going on. And for some with family, most of you probably don't have um, you know, 67 children or something like that, which would be fun to see what Nathan would do. In the, you know. But, um, you know, most of you don't have, and the number of children we have or where family is and those kinds of things. I, I do want this month just to pause and say, let, let's think of our biological family. Let's think of our adopted family. And I'm even thinking adopted family without paperwork. You, you guys know what I'm talking about with that, Right. You have people that you call aunts and uncles, and there's, they've just always been family, right? Or you've taken somebody in to be family. But the third one is our spiritual family. And as you come here, the sense, I hope, 
I know we have some people who are, are guests with us today. We thrilled you're here. I hope you feel the sense of family here and that you are welcomed here and wanted here. And so in this month, for Family Month, we are going to go through the book of Ruth. And so this morning, I am going to go through, verse by verse, Ruth chapter 1. And so I, I, want to, I have a three-point outline, because that's what I'm supposed to have, right? Um, but the first one comes from verses 1 through 5. And it's, I'm just referencing this section as turning away. And so if you want to look in the book of Ruth, we're going to go into the Old Testament. You have the, right after the law and that, you have Joshua, Judges, Ruth. And if you're not careful, you'll go right past it. It's only four chapters. Um, it's a book you may not have spent time with before. We do put the verses up on the screen. And so if you want to follow along that way, you may also. But let me go ahead and verse chapter, chapter 1, verse 1 of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled... There was a famine in the land. I want to pause right there for a moment. In the day when the judges ruled. So we're in the, we're in the time of the judges. In the book of Judges, I, I reminded of Judges 17.6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. If you do a study of the book of Judges, you're going to find a situation where they, the people get caught up in sin like the other nations. There's a time of suffering. They have supplication or prayer, praying for someone to come, and then God delivers them. There's salvation. So that sin, suffering, supplication, salvation is a cycle that constantly goes through in, in, the, in the book of Judges. And so the book of Ruth is in that time. It talks about a famine. And if you remember with some of the judges, one of them was Gideon. And Gideon was hiding out, but it was in a time of famine. So they think it's very possible this book of Ruth could be at the time of Gideon. Let's continue back in verse 1 of Ruth 1. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So this guy, Elimelech, decides to leave Bethlehem and, and go to Moab. And it sounds very basic, just somebody's just taking his, his wife, two boys, and they're going to go to this area. Now, Moab is just east of the Dead Sea. And so, um, the Sea of Galilee is the top. You have the Jordan River coming down, and then the, the Dead Sea um, is, is, comes down at the bottom of that. Um, I've been there. I've swam there. <laughs> I, I guess I floated there. If you're familiar with the Dead Sea at all, it's um, a, a very in, intriguing body of water. Um, it, it is hard to submerge because of the chemicals. Um, the ocean is about 7% mineral salt. The, sea of, the Dead Sea is 28 to 33%. And so it has no outlet. So everything comes down to it. So it's right off to the, the east of it. So it's away from Israel. They're crossing over to get there. Um, Genesis chapter 19, we're familiar with this area because of Sodom and Gomorrah, when God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. You also have from there the origin of Moab, of the nation of Moab. And um, I want to be careful how I phrase this. Um, Lot and his family leave. And as they're leaving, Lot's wife looks back. We remember that and, and the punishment that comes there. Um, but then he goes away and his daughters uh, think they're never going to have children. And get dad drunk, and from that you have two nations, Ammon and Moab, comes back from this. So this is not a, a nation that they're supposed to be partaking with. It's not a nation that Elimelech should have taken his family to. It's not a nation they should be involved with or marry into. It's, it's a nation of other gods, and it would, it would have been, in our New Testament terminology, we would have said unequally yoked, right? And so let's go to verse 2 now. I'm in Ruth 1 still. The name of the, of the man was Elimelech, and his name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of the two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Apophathites from Bethlehem in Judah. I, I mean, Malon and Chilion, the, their names that, the Chilion, I mean, you know what his nickname's going to be, right? It's just going to have to be Chill. It, it sounds like a fun name and that kind of thing. I don't want to spend a lot of time on uh, why they're named the way they're named and give a whole message and, and read into something that's not there. But um, their names mean something like 
um, sickly and weak. Um, even the, um, the idea of Chilean is to be like the frailty, mortality. And, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, like, is there one of those situations that when they were born, they just didn't look healthy? And so why name them that way? I, I don't know. I don't have anything more than that. But their names are not very powerful, masculine names that we would normally think of. The, they were Epaphrathites um, from Bethlehem is a little bit redundant, and I think for a reason, because in, in Genesis 35, 19, so Rachel died and she was buried on the way to Epaphrath, that is Bethlehem. So Epaphrath is another name for Bethlehem. So I, I think it's trying to be very specific, and I, I know that we, the discussion for us is, are we Michiganders or Michiganians? You know, and wh- where are you from? And just, you know, wh- which way is it? And is that a UP or, you know, it's just all those kinds of discussions. But to be from Bethlehem is going to become a very important area, right? Because of David, and then we continue on to New Testament with Jesus. And so the emphasis here of this being an actual factual story that takes place, the, these people are from a very special area called Bethlehem. And that is home for them. They're not transplants because of, you know, they're not typically from, a lot of people around here, like Angela's family, would be from Virginia, West Virginia. Her parents came up because of automotive. Right? They work in the coal mines. A lot, of, a lot of those different nationalities are coming up. Her Italian family coming up for that. This is a situation where they're from Bethlehem and they're from Bethlehem. <laughs> this, is, this is who they are. Let's go to... Verse 2, they went into the country of Moab and remained there. I know as we're reading through this, it sounds so simple and uneventful. But a lot happened to get them into the promised land. When it came about for a vote of whether or not to go into the promised land, the land that God had promised, and the vote was 10 to 2, and do, you, do you remember that whole thing with Joshua and Caleb, and, and the vote against them, and the... Um, the people saying, well, there's giants there, and we can't go into the land, and they're like, but they're not bigger than God. And, you know, we, we need to go. And then for 40 years, they wander in the wilderness because they haven't been obedient about this. And so the, getting into the promised land was a very big deal. To be there is huge. And so for Elimelech to leave is really showing a, a lack of trust in God. He's walking away from what God had for them. The tough, the, the, the life got tough and he decided to do it his own way and walk away. I want to pause there for a moment and just let us think for ourselves. Are there some things I'm supposed to be doing right now that I'm, I'm not? And I'm, and I'm not fully giving in to God and, I, and I'm, I'm holding back. I know what he wants me to do but, I, but, I'm, but I'm not comfortable doing that right now. It puts me out of my comfort zone. And so just to evaluate, let's go to verses 3 through 5. But Limelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah. I read somewhere that that's where Oprah got her name. Her mother misspelled it. I thought that's okay. I just interesting. And the other name was Ruth. They lived about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died. So the woman were left without, the woman was left without two sons and her husband. It's a tragic story. You know, let's pause and think about that for a moment. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about them leaving. They shouldn't have left. But the fact they left, and then she loses her husband. And, and for a woman in that culture, it would have been very difficult. And the sons to step up to help out, not sure on how healthy they were, right, with their names. But again, I'm not reading into that too much. But they both die at a young age. And so now you have a mother with her two daughter-in-laws. And we know that as soon as you hear, like, the name mother-in-law, it's a very positive, encouraging a little bit of sarcasm in my tone, right, of, of what we're thinking about with this. And, and here they are, the in-laws are together. I 
pause, think about this, because sometimes someone else's decision affects me. Elimelech's decision affected his wife and his boys. And how we respond to someone else's decision, we need to stop with excuses. I, I'm, you know, the, the generation that's, I don't know how many generations are after me now. It used to be every 25 years was a new generation. I think sometimes it's now every five years. But these generations coming about that are constantly blaming their parents for everything. And it's like, I understand on how you were raised has an effect on you, but man up. <laughs> Grow up. Take some ownership of your own life. And for Malon and Chilion to say, well, dad brought us here. Who would you expect us to marry? No, no. You weren't supposed to marry. Moabite women. You should have waited for God's timing or gone and looked for them. Proverbs 14, 12 is repeated in Proverbs 16, 25. And it says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And I, that's, I know that's very harsh, but I think very applicable for this passage. They're going to do it their way and it doesn't go well for them. Let me go to my second point. And it's the concept of turning back. And the title of this message, I've been working with this, is just Return God of Second Chances. And, and if, you, if you miss a lot of what I'm saying today, please capture that God of Second Chances. Because I've experienced the God of Second Chances. I've, I've experienced God's forgiveness. I experienced God's forgiveness and salvation, but unfortunately I've had to experience God's forgiveness after salvation. Is anybody else with me on this one? Am I the only one who's, who needs to hear this message right now? We, we all understand this, right? And that we need God daily. And so, in, in verses 6 through 14 of Ruth 1, then Naomi arose with her daughter in laws to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughter in laws, and they went on to the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her, Two daughter-in-laws, go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. What a beautiful statement she's saying to them. For the two of you, go back to your, go back to your families. You, you have been very kind to my husband and to my boys. You, you, you've, you've been good daughter-in-laws. You, you've been good wives. And her acknowledging that in a time of pain the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of, their hu of her husband. She's wishing that they would remarry. Um, please, please remarry. You, 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 you've done what you were supposed to do. You're, you're good, my boys. Please remarry. Then she kissed them and lifted up voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that were become your husbands? And it's very interesting. Like a beautiful movie script, early on, they're introducing a major theme for the book, Kinsman Redeemer. Maybe you've heard that before. Or just call it Family Redeemer. Angela and I have a family friend who, um, when his brother died, um, he's Chaldean, so it would be a natural thing. When his brother died, he took his brother's wife and kids and raised them as his own and, and even married his sister-in-law, because that's, that would be the cultural thing. And they're introducing it here, and she's like, I don't have any other sons. Who's going to take care of you? you? You need to go marry. She goes, turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you re therefore refrain from marrying? She's saying, okay, so let, let's get the situation here. If I get married right now and have a child within the year and it happens to be a son, <laughs> are you going to wait how many years to marry them for them to take care of you? And she's like, it's not reasonable. Don't, don't think that way. I'm not, I'm not going to have two more sons. I'm not, I don't plan to get married. I, I don't. So she's go on. She goes, no, my daughter's. For it is exceeding bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. 
It's interesting through all of this. I think we have Naomi understanding that God's involved. And that the discipline's coming. And I think she's realizing that we're not supposed to be in Moab. I think she's known this for some time. And she realized the discipline's come upon. And and the way we we view that discipline is on us. In this situation, is God disciplining or is he restoring? And if you follow through with the book of Ruth, and hopefully you will in the upcoming weeks, you'll see that it takes us all the way to Jesus and bringing in who Jesus is. I think Naomi follows God in response to his discipline. Even though there's going to be disappointment, there's also direction. Orpah finds no physical blessing there, and so she follows herself. Ruth sees no physical blessing for herself, but she chooses to follow God. And I wonder with, in your family cycle, we tend to be like our parents, which can be a major blessing. But where they were wrong, if we don't notice it and intentionally do different, we're going to do the same thing. If, if you are a parent, you will probably remember a time where you said something like, oh, that was my mother speaking or that was my father speaking. And we're like, we're, it's just like, wow, I, I sound like... And that's not necessarily a bad thing, correct? It's just the way we were raised. And so you have here the opportunity to break a family cycle. If you've come from a very dysfunctional family, you don't have to stay with that being your future heritage. And so make those choices to do the right thing. You have a turning away. I think chapter 1 is really about that turning back. We have that word return used four times. An emphasis on returning, of going back. I can't help but think of Luke 15, 17 through 19 with the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son situation? I'm, I'm, I'm baffled by this every time I think through it. Because a man has two sons, and the one son says, Dad, I'm really tired of, this is my paraphrase, by the way. Um, he goes, Dad, I'm really tired of being around here. I, I want to do things my way. Can I have my inheritance now? I'm like, wait, are you like saying, like, Dad, you're dead to me? That's what he's saying. Can I have my inheritance? Which if the other son comes and says, can I have my inheritance also? Then dad's left with nothing? And that's what he does. He's like, let me have my heaven. He goes off and just wastes it on whatever he wants until he finds himself literally in a pig pen and evaluating life. And again, Luke 15, 17 through 19. But when that prodigal son, when he came to himself, he said, I love that phrase though, when he came to himself, Sometimes we need to come to ourselves. Sometimes like, no, really? Is that where I'm going to go with this? Let me process this. I'm, wow, this was not the right choice. When he came to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. How beautiful is that, right? He, he's processing it, and the story continues on, right? He heads back for his, his father. And I know some of you are ahead of me, and, and I hope you are in your thinking, but the father's been waiting for him. The father's looking for him, and I'm not one who likes running in sandals. Well, I mean, at this age, I may not be one who likes running, <laughs> but, but you, you see the father who grabs right onto, onto his robe kind of thing, pulls it up, And starts running toward his son, embracing him, not treating him like a servant. Is that the God we worship? Is that the God we may have forgotten? If you're here in the auditorium or if you're, you know, participating online, 
If you've wandered away from him, as long as you have breath, it's not too late. He's anticipating you to come back. He's desiring you to come back. He's welcoming you to come back and wants to embrace you and enjoy life with you. Let's go through verses 15 through 22. And my third point is just the reward. Verse 15, Ruth 1. And Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. She's talking to Ruth now. So Orpah's already left. You go ahead and do the same thing. And again, remember, but Ruth clung on to her. <laughs> She's holding on. She's not letting her go. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. And this next part is beautiful. A lot of you have heard this part before. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death separates me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. You have the gods of the Moabites that Ruth and Orpah would have been very familiar with and would have been raised worshiping. When it comes down to this difficult time, Orpah knows she needs to go back there. That's, where, that's what she's trained in her mind to do. That's where it's safe. And Ruth, through all of this, and, and I'm one who I, I believe that, and we're going to hear of Naomi change her name to Mara and Bitter, um, I don't think she was bitter with God. I think she was bitter with life. And I think that's part of the message some of you may need to hear today. Is it okay to be bitter with life and not be bitter with God? Can you have that distinction going on? And I think you can. To to have things good with God doesn't mean we like everything that's going on. I can be displeased with life and still love God and serve Him with a whole heart. And Ruth says, your God will be my God. But she also references the Lord. I think she's already at this point become a follower of God looking for the Messiah. Verses 19 through 22. So the two of them, Naomi and Ruth, went out until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter in Hebrew. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? I don't think she's criticizing what God has done. She's acknowledging that she has done something that shouldn't have happened. That Elimelech and Naomi leaving Bethlehem should not have happened. And God has dealt with her. I've was raised at a time where um, paddling happened. Do, do, I, do, do I need to define a paddle for some of you? Is this a phrase that we could use for our game? Okay, a paddle. Do we know what a paddle is? Do you know what a paddling is, right? Um, matter of fact, some of you are saying, like, seriously, your parents paddled you? No, my school teacher. <laughs> do we, do I, I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hands because I know some of you know what I'm talking about, right? But, but this whole idea of discipline... And you get to a point where I don't like the discipline, but I know that it's not the teacher's fault that I did the wrong thing. It's not. Discipline's coming. I need to own up. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of, of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. The whole town was stirred. The excitement of welcome back. They've been gone for, we've told, what, more than 10 years? And and, and they're coming back, and and they've known each other, and they're excited for them to come back, and the town is stirred. Why do bad things happen to good people? I think a couple of them could be poor choices. We make a poor choice, God brings us back. Or God has a plan, and he's doing something special. I want to realize right now and take the moment For those who have felt they've strayed from the Lord. 
that realize he's waiting for you to come back? That he comes wanting to forgive. He doesn't hold back on it. Isaiah 43, 25. This message, I think, is forgiveness and redemption. In Isaiah 43, 25, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I, I added my notes here later as I was going through this, this last week. Satan likes to remind us of sin and failure. It's not God that does. Once we've come and sought forgiveness, it's not God who constantly brings it back. Satan wants to see us fall. You know, that, what is it? Misery loves company kind of thing. Isaiah 118, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Hebrews 10, 7, 10, then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. He chooses not to remember them. God is not one who can forget. If he can forget, then God's not God. Does that make sense? If, if, you, if you're omniscient, you can't forget. But he chooses not to bring them up again. He chooses not to remember. He chooses not to focus on them but to forgive us in his love. Daniel 9.9, 9, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. I don't know what you've been raised with, and I was raised in a little bit more of a, they'll say conservative, I'll say legalistic kind of church setting. And, and, and at an early age, unfortunately I had this mindset of God that he would sit up in heaven looking for opportunities to zap me. Anybody with me on that one? You guys and it's just like every step I took. And then we even got to the, you know, I'm graduating from high school in the late 70s. And it's like, well, is that what you'd want to do when Jesus returns? Are you going to want to be caught doing that? When Jesus... And it was always a guilt kind of thing for us. As opposed to a God who sits in heaven wanting to bless us. When we go go astray, he, he wants to bring us back. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about a God who, who ignores our lives and our sin. But he's, because of love, he brings us back. But he's looking for opportunities to say, like, oh, wow, we're going to celebrate that. Isn't that the kind of parents we want to be? We, 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 we watch the playground of our kids or we watch go to a game and we just want us after the game say, like, oh, I watched what you did there. That was so cool. And be so excited with them. Isn't that the God we have? He belongs mercy and forgiveness. Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so does he remove our transgressions from us. And then 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I, I want to pause there because I obviously don't know everybody here. I mean, I've been here six months, so I know everybody very well, right? <laughs> I obviously don't know everybody here, but I've said this before, there's two things I do know. No one here is so far from God they can't be saved. No one here is so good they don't need a Savior. <laughs> if you haven't given your life to the Lord, please realize He wants to forgive you. He wants you to come to Him and say, I've sinned. I've fallen from you. I, I, I don't even deserve who you are. But because of your love, you've sent your son Jesus, who always was, is, and forever will be God, who lived a perfect life, died for sin, my sin. All who buried him, he rose again. He's alive, willing to offer me eternal life and life to the full, life with a purpose, a calling. When we place our faith, faith in him. It's, it's that Believe and repent. It's placing our trust in him and then turning from serving ourselves to wanting to follow him and serve him. If you haven't given your life to the Lord, please do it today. You don't have to be in the auditorium. You don't have to be with the pastor. It's a conversation with God. I say conversation with God. We, we call that prayer. Sometimes that can be an intimidating phrase or word for somebody. But just talking with God saying, I know I've sinned and you sent your son to die for my sin. He's alive, though. He rose again. I believe. I give you my life. And then he had one more thing. Thank him for saving you. Say, thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. And then strive to live a life for him. If you've done that just right now, 
please let someone know. Through those doors, on the way out today, we'll have um, someone at guest services. You can let them know if you have more questions about it. Feel free to um, go to that 97,000 number and ask there, that River Connect one. Or you could just email at info at theriverchurch.cc. You can go that way also. Um, pull me aside. We'll sit down and talk. And I'll, the question I think you should ask is, how can I know from the Bible that when I die, I'm going to heaven? I don't want just some person's opinion. I want God's opinion. How can I know from the Bible that when I die, I'm going to heaven? I think of that. I think there's another group here, though. Those who are saved, that maybe are struggling with something right now. They've asked for forgiveness. And somebody else may have forgiven them. And they know up here that God's forgiven them. <laughs> but they're not willing to forgive themselves. Is that where you're at? Please, please, as a believer, receive God's forgiveness. He wants to forgive us. He doesn't want us labeled in that sin. He wants us labeled as his child. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, we read, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We're a new creation because of Jesus Christ. We're going through the book of Ruth, and the, the, the theme that they've chosen for this week is faithfulness to family. And I, and I, I believe that the interpretation of Scripture of Ruth chapter 1 is more of them talking about coming back and, and have gone away, coming back, the returning, and, and the redemption story coming. But the application when it comes to commitment to family, and again, when I talk about family, I can be talking about biological, adopted, <laughs> and then also our spiritual family. And just thinking through the faithfulness there, I, I, there's a lot of things that, when it comes to application, we have a little more freedom we're talking about, because I'm not saying this is what this passage was meant for at the time, but on how we can draw away for it now. I, I think that Naomi felt what was best for the girls is for them to go. It was a very selfless act, I thought, for her to say, girls, go ahead and take care of yourself. Orpah said, yeah, that's what's best for me, <laughs> and she leaves. Ruth says, that might be what's best for me, but I don't know, what does God have? And then she goes, but I'm not leaving you, Naomi. What's best for you? I wonder with our families, is there times where we need to give people some space? And sometimes where we need to hold tight. Are, are, there, are, are there times, I mean, it becomes interesting. Sometimes when a child turns 18, it's really easy to set them off. <laughs> and sometimes it's not as easy, right? And it's just, that can be a lot of personality types. And it, and it can be, with each of your children, be a different situation. But of letting go or holding on and figuring out that. I think it all starts with our faithfulness to God. I'm faithful to family because I'm faithful to God. I have some family members that if they weren't family members, they would be very dear friends to me. I'm very, I have some family members that might not be that way. <laughs> I probably have some family members that say the same thing about me, right? No, that, none of them say that. No, but it's just, we all have, well, what do they say, that every family has that person that's a little bit off, and if your family doesn't, it's probably you? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> But we're still faithful to family. Family was instituted by God. It's God's design. It's not man's design. And so for realizing who he's put around us. Now, our spiritual family and who we're here looking out for each other. The, the, the people who are around regularly, that adopted family that takes us in or we take them in. The choosing to be faithful there also. Let me wrap this up with... D.L. Moody, uh, a pastor and um, evangelist who said, a man ought to live so that everybody knows he's a Christian 
And most of all, his family ought to know. Our faithfulness to family starts with faithfulness to God. Our faithfulness to God starts in our family and being true to our family. I know for a number of us, it's, um, we get into a situation where uh, our kids get older. Our son turned 39 Friday. Um, it's difficult for Angela because she can't say she's 29 anymore. And now she's got to get away from 39. You know, it's just like, um, I, I, already, I accept I'm old. Some people say, we're getting old. I'm like, I've, I've arrived. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but um, my son may be 39 and our daughter's 35. I'm a parent for life. That's a blessing. Oh, there becomes a friendship age as they get older. But I'm a parent for life. And I'm going to tell you, there are some times the only thing we can do, which is the first thing we should do, is pray for them. Pray for family. Don't make it the last resort. Start there. Find out what God would have you to do, but continue there. It's that idea of praying um, that God would show up and that they would see that it's God showing up and give him credit and follow him. Um, we're going to be taking communion in a moment, and um, the guy who's going to be coming up is Nathan, and um, he's going to be a lot more excited today because he had a lot of children back there, a little more excitement going on for him, and rude rejuvenate him, but he'll be lead us in communion. And so let me pray and then turn it over to him. Father, we thank you for the, your word. We thank you for preserving it and even having it translated in our language so we can study it throughout the week. We thank you for the book of Ruth, for the reminder that although we will stray from you, you're willing to bring us back. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for second chances. We're not looking for excuses. We want to follow you closely and lead others to you. We pray right now as we observe the communion table that we'll be reminded of what you've done for us and that we'll examine ourselves. We thank you for your love and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.